the beasts. So was man created after the beast or was he created before the beasts? Scientific di dilemma. Then you have also problems. You've got problems about the historical issues. Here we've got the a picture of the epics of Gilgamesh. This is the epics of Gilgamesh. And you find stories there which are found in the Old Testament. What are they doing there? What are they doing in the Old Testament? And why have Christians not been honest in looking at it? Who is copying whom? Parallels between the epics of Gilgamesh and the Bible. Parallels between the Egyptian book of the dead and the Bible. Parallels between Mithraism, as I showed you earlier on in Christ. The Code of Hammurabi and the laws of the Pentateuch. Centuries before the Bible came into existence. So that's a problem. That's another case of Amenophis, and you look his, at his uh, particular account, similar to Psalm chapter 104. Metzger, one of the most highly respected biblical scholars, says that in his book, many errors have crept into the Bible, and he speaks about errors from faulty eyesight, errors from faulty hearing, errors of the mind, judgment, difficulties in terms of historical and geographical alterations, and so on and so forth. Many times, whole belief systems can be changed. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 virgin and young woman what's the actual word Joseph Parker says more is told of the genealogy than the day of the this year is the genealogy of Jesus Christ according to Matthew this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ according to Matthew that's in there open the gospel of Matthew and check that this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ according to Luke. So Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel, you have a difference of how many words? 66 fathers and grandfathers. No two names are identical. This is Matthew's Gospel, the genealogy. This is Luke's Gospel. And look at the differences that you find here. And they're not identical. So if we are saying they are the word of God and if Matthew was inspired and if Luke was inspired, why is it that we've got different names? Is one Joseph's genealogy, the other is Mary. It speaks about Jesus Christ. The other, Luke, Jesus Christ. There is no Mary there. The only name common between the two is Joseph the carpenter. And he could not have been the father of Jesus because we were told that he was only the supposed, the putative father of Jesus. So what is going on here? We need to be honest, we need to ask ourselves the question, what is going on? And the... We, 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 we don't want any chanting or anything along that line, but it's important too. And when you go on further, if you even analyze his genealogies, you find men and women who deserve to be stoned to death are in the genealogy. Judah and Tamar. Uh, Ruth and Bathsheba. Between David and Jesus, Matthew records 26 ancestors. David and Jesus, Luke records 41 forefathers. Only name common is that of Joseph. So that's a problem. Then you have other problems where God is described in anthropomorphic terms. I said here, Baba God, a roaring God, a penitent God, a God riding a cherub, a God well, murdering 50,000 and 70 for looking in the box, a hissing God. Now these are not things which I'd like to deal with, but since I've spoken of Pitt and we are going to be open about this, this is something which we need to deal with. In one example, for example, then went out smoke from his nostrils and fire out of his mouth in 2 Samuel 22 verse 11. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down and darkness was under his feet and he rode upon a cherub and did fly and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. 2 Samuel 22 verse 11. What's a cherub? God riding upon a cherub. What's a cherub? This is a picture of a cherub. That's a cherub. Childlike angel. That's a cherub. Then you have other aspects. The Amalekite massacre. Was the Amalekite massacre moral atrocity? 400 years before, go and smite Amalek, utterly destroy them all, spare them not, slay both man, woman, infant, suckling, oxen, sheep, camel, and ass. We don't have passages like that in the Quran. You want to quote Surah 9 verse 5 or Surah 47? Go on and quote them and we'll deal with them. But we don't have passages which authorize sanguinary warfare. Other passages such as the books of Joshua. Cannibalism, the king said, what aileth thee? This was in respect of a, of a particular um, famine that took place. 
This woman said unto me, Give thy son that we may eat him today, and we will eat him tomorrow. So we boiled my son and did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, Give thy son that we may eat him. And she had hid her son. Judah and Tamar, there are stories such as Judah and Tamar in Genesis chapter 38, which no person could read. Because the passage raises a number of questions. It's lewd in its content. Thomas Paine, and this is what he says, I don't necessarily subscribe to it. He was a revolutionary radical. He said the obscene stories are repugnant to our ideas of purity of the divine being. And the horrid cruelties and murders it scribes to him are repugnant to our ideas of justice. So that's a problem. Scientific problems. Purification of women after childbirth. Leviticus chapter 12 verse 1 to 5. If a woman bears a male child, she is unclean for seven days. If she bears a female child, she is unclean for 14 days. Why? Menstruating women have to be ostracized from society. Leviticus chapter 15 verse 19. Thus put aside for seven days. Creatures of mythology. The existence of unicorns and bulls and so on. Serpents, dragons. That's something which we find in mythology. Maybe it's something which is allegorical. So what is going on? The shape of the earth, and um, I don't have, uh, I think uh, uh, Pitt spoke about the shape of the earth being flat, but if you take a coin of round, if you take a coin, how does it look? The coin is round, but the coin is flat as well. So if you look at these verses here in Daniel 4 verse 10 to 11, a tree grew from the midst of the earth, its height unto the heavens of the earth, it was visible to all the ends of the earth. This could only be possible if the earth was flat. Can you see the difficulty we are facing? The bitter water test for adultery. What happens here is that if a woman is caught for adultery, she's brought to a priest and that priest tests he makes her stand before the Lord. She shall take some holy water, mix it in a clay jar, and put some dust. And if she drinks it and if a thigh rots, that's a sign she commits adultery. Virginity testing. How does one test? In Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 13 to 18. In the accusation of slander, they bring the child to the father, and the father takes the tokens of virginity, and he takes a cloth to the elders as proof of the virginity, or as proof that she is she's no longer a virgin and so the cloth was obviously inserted to determine the virginity that's workings of scribes it's not the workings of God who did Mary see at the sepulcher the most famous incident after the so-called resurrection in Matthew 28 right up till John you find different accounts was it an angel was it a young man was it two men was it two angels was it all of them so that's a problem we have which we need to deal with. And of course, these are the missing books which the Old Testament mentions. Pete spoke about the Apocrypha, but these are books mentioned in the cover of the Bible. And when you look there, you find that these books are not there. None of them. All of them are mentioned there. None of them are there. They're not there. And these are, of course, the common views in Catholicism. Now, that's a problem we've got. When you come to the Quran, and if you analyze it, and look at it, who wrote the Quran? Number one, the name Quran is frequently mentioned. It states to whom, why, and when it was delivered. It was revealed to Muhammad over a period of 23 years. It was memorized immediately after re revelation. So even if one were to assume that manuscripts are corrupted, if one were to assume that today I had a Quranic text which was full of mistakes in the Arabic, it would not be a problem. Why not? Because you look at any Hufaz or any uh, memorizer of the Quran, he would basically know what the verse is. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar Rahmani Rahim, Malik Yomideen. If you see something different, that can easily be picked up. And that's how the Quran was preserved. Because it was recited, preserved in the memory in Ramadan, in Tarawih, 30 days, 30 nights, you recite the entire the Quran. So in the early Muslim community, we have it. In Tarawih Salah, when someone makes a mistake, what happens? What happens? The other Hufas corrects him. So if that practice was there in the early Muslim community where the Quran was preserved through recitation, it would not even make a difference if there were variants at all in other manuscripts. And as scholars tell us, that even there, those variants were nothing more than dialectical differences. Nothing more, nothing less. Not in the Qureshi dialect, a different dialect. 
So we don't have that problem. We don't have verses missing. Entire chapter on the ascension missing. We don't have passages like that in the Quran. We don't have manuscripts to substantiate that. None of that is there. And rightfully so, sir, William Muir quoted, there is probably in the world no other book which has remained 12 centuries with so pure a text. In fact, he's forced to concede further on that yet but one Quran existed and get the copy the life of Muhammad by William Muir. It's a critical analysis of the life of the Prophet Muhammad. He's forced to concede in the preface when he deals with the Quranic uh, discussion that there has always been a single Quran. There hasn't been dozens of Qurans with different uh, verses, verses missing here, verses missing there. Yes, you'd have uh, Christian missionaries quoting from the Kitab al-Masahif of Ibn Abi Dawud. They'd give you the works of Arthur Jeffrey, materials for the collection of the history of the Quran, and they'd quote Jeffrey selectively. But even Jeffrey himself says that these particular um, um, uh, recitations or hadiths which speak about the differences, the isnad is weak, the chain of narration is weak, so you can't even rely on them. Show us a manuscript today, that's a challenge, show us a manuscript where you have a verse missing in that manuscript or a verse in the manuscript which is not in the Quran. Show us a manuscript. You won't be able to show us a manuscript. And you look at Gerdar Pun, in fact the Yemeni government, they, they, haven't, they haven't kept this um, disclosed or unclosed from the public. They are making the public aware of this. Sooner or later the Sanaa manuscripts will be available for public uh, uh, viewing. Like the Samarkand or like the Tashkent or like what you find in the Topkabi Museum in Istanbul. They are easily available. Problem is, your existing Old and New Testament do not conform to the manuscripts. What you have is an eclectic edition. And that's a problem, not the translation. Forget the translation. I'm talking about the Greek New Testament. I'm talking about the Hebrew Old Testament. That is a problem. That's a construct. That's developed based on existing manuscripts. And scholars believe what they think is right, they basically pick and choose. We don't have that problem in Islam. That's the picture which Pet elaborated about the Sana manuscripts. And check it. Check it and compare with the Quran. One of the European philosophers, Carlyle, states that if a book comes from the heart, it will contrive to reach other hearts. All art and orthocraft, a small amount to that. One would say that the primary character of the Quran is this of its genuineness, of it being a bona fide book. That's what Carlyle stated. And the Catholic Encyclopedia says, over the years, many theories have been offered in respect of the origins of the Quran. Many theories. Today, no sensible person accepts them. So what should I believe? Should I accept the Catholic Encyclopedia? Or should I accept the presentation that Pitt or many of these other missionaries or some of these Orientalists do today? That's the age-old Catholic Encyclopedia making such a statement. The three different theories pertaining to the authorship, whether he was the author, whether he obtained it from other sources or religious scriptures, uh, the Holy Quran does not have a human author, but it's from the realm of the divine. These are the kind of three theories that you basically have. And if you analyze them, firstly, it would be highly abnormal to challenge the testimony of a person who claims authorship, who disclaims responsibility. If I write a book, why would I want to disclaim responsibility? Secondly, he never claimed he was the author. Thirdly, those who refused to accept his message continued giving him valuables for safekeeping, which means they trusted his honesty. It condemns the use of scriptural use for material gain. In fact, the Prophet's financial position deteriorated after he claimed prophethood than before. He had more to lose after Nubuat than before Nubuat. So why take the risk? unless he was what he claimed he was, a bona fide prophet. In respect of the fact that it's copied from other sources, it identifies as a divine. The Quran has a particular idiom and divine style. I will show in the rebuttal section how, if you contrast the biblical account and the Quranic account, there's a difference in style. And Pitt, the Quran is not written in the third person. Open the Quran. You'd have, for example, verses of the Quran where it speaks about um, Moses, but that's Moses' word, I in inverted commas. 
But it will read, this is what we reveal unto thee, O apostle, by inspiration. Thou wast not with them when they cast lots with arrows as to which of them should be with the kid. Do we have a verse like that? Do we have a verse in the Bible which says, O mankind, we created you from a single pair and made you into nations and tribes that you may recognize each other. Do we have that? We don't have that. It's not there. And this is the issue of exhausting the alternatives. Please question me at question time. I don't have the time to go into this. We'll deal with this if I can in the rebuttal section. Until the mid 20th century, the prevalent view across the world was that the universe was infinite. Today we know that the universe had a beginning and came into existence by means of a Big Bang. It's not a theory. It's not a theory. It was a theory at one time, Pete. But today you look at someone like Stephen Hawking. He tell you the same thing, check up a brief discovery of time. Um, Edwin Hubble, for example, and Hawking said that the discovery that the universe is expanding is one of the great intellectual revolutions of the 20th century. What do you have as a fundamentalist to rebut that? Nothing. You don't have anything. Don't provide, don't challenge him if you don't have an alternative to what he propounds. An Arab living in the desert 1400 years could not have known that. So where does he get this information from? That with the power and skill did we construct the firmament. For it is we who are constantly expanding it. We. Not the third person, God Almighty talking. We who are constantly expanding the vastness of space. Surah 51 verse 47. The shape of the earth is flat. Francis Drake in 1597 discovered that. Yet you find in Surah An-Naziat chapter 79 verse 30, you read the expression, The earth moreover had he made it egg-shaped. The haha means egg-shaped, rounded like an ostrich egg. People in the past believed that the earth was flat. People during the time of Jesus believed the earth was flat. People in the time of Moses, in the time when the Old Testament was written, believed the earth was flat. Therefore, when it speaks about God sitting upon the circle of the earth, that circle of the earth, you take a coin and you hold the coin in the palm of your hand. How is a coin? The coin is flat. Circle of the earth, coin is flat. I believe the earth was flat. And this was something which he spoke about at length. Now, I haven't dealt with the creation account and we'll deal with it maybe at rebuttal time. But the problem is that in the Quran, unlike the Bible, in the past, it was believed that the moon emanates its own light. Science now tells us that the light of the moon is reflected light. Nur. The Quran makes a distinction. Because the Arabic word for sun is shams. The Arabic with siraj meaning a torch, wahaj, a blazing lamp. The Arabic word for moon is kamar, which means nur, reflected light. It doesn't make that distinction. It makes a distinction between the two types of light. Not once in the Quran is the moon described as Siraj, Wahaj, or Diha, or Diya, or the sun as Nur, or Munir. So can you see what we have? The rotation of the sun. European philosophers thought that the sun was stationary. Now we know the sun rotates itself. Who taught the Prophet Muhammad this? It is he who created the night and the day, sun and the moon, also along each in its own celestial rounded cause. Who taught him that? If not the creator himself. And the Arabic word is yasbahun. Not permitted for the sun to catch up with the moon, nor can the night outstrip the day. Each just swims along in its own orbit according to law. Yet in the book of Joshua chapter 10 verse 15 I believe, we told that the sun stood still at a particular point in time. We know what will happen if the sun stands still and the moon stands still and the earth stands still, the entire solar system and the entire Milky Way will be in chaos if that ever happened. Can you see the difficulties we are facing again and again as you traverse and check these particular verses? Interstellar galactic matter, the presence of matter, ionized gas that's in the air, in the particles. Now we know that in Surah 25 verse 29, what do we see? The presence of interstellar galactic matter. It is He who created the heavens and the earth and all matter that is in between. Who taught the Prophet Muhammad that? Was the Prophet aware of the presence of intergalactic matter 1400 years ago? Was he? Did he know this? That's something which people need to ask if they are challenging the authenticity of the Quran. 
the existence of subatomic particles. The atom we know, something smaller than the atom exists, science tells us. You find in the Quran, it recognizes the existence of the atom and the dharra, that which is smaller than the atom. Surah 34 verse 3. Only now science tells us that even the atom can be split into two. It was never known 1400 years ago. Two minutes. And again, existence of mountains like pigs, stakes in geology, the phenomenon of folding, responsible for the creation of mountains. What do you find here? It's like a stake. It's like a pig. It's stuck in the ground like an anchor. The phenomenon of folding. It's responsible for mountains because if it was not there, then the crust would basically shake and move each time you walk. That's a, that's a Rocky Mountains, I believe, in the United States. And here you have another stakes of peg likes. Uh, in Europe, the Russian platform, the Caucasus and so on. But what does the Quran say? Have we not made the earth as wide and the mountains as stakes? Lest it should shake with them, the word tamida bihim, which means shake as opposed to zilzal. So the mountains serve as stabilizing factors to prevent the crust from shaking. Oceanology, now we know that the oceans don't meet, two different rivers don't meet. There's a partition, a barrier between them. I experienced this myself. This was in Cape Ogullis, in Cape Town, where you see the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean, they don't meet. They don't meet. You can actually see the, the different style, the water texture. They do not meet. There's like a barrier, a barzakh. And what does the Quran say? It says, he has let free the two bodies of flowing water meeting together. Between them is a barrier which they do not transgress. The Barzakh, Surah 55, verses 19 to 20. Or he has made a separating bar between the two bodies of flowing water. Read the Quran, see what it says. In fact, even the principles of oceanography, this chap says that it's just as if a thin wall were between the oceans. That's what the Quran says 1400 years ago. So folks, that's what we have. In the early 80s, a group of Arabs gathered info from the Quran and presented it to Keith Moore. And so what he, when he analyzed the actual Quranic text, uh, development of embryology and so on, and he, he presented two particular verses. One was Surah Iqra, Surah Alak, Iqra, Bismi Rabbika Ladi Khalak, reading the name of our Lord who created man out of a leech-like substance. And he took an embryo, he checked it under a microscope, and he took a leech and he checked it up. And the kind of similarities which he found was almost identical. Leech, embryo, slightly developed one, almost identical. And he said that if I had been asked this question 30 years ago, I would not have been able to answer them for lack of scientific information. That's what Keith Moore says in respect of the Quran. So that's what you have. And in a sense, in conclusion, to attribute the presence of scientific facts to the Quran to coincidence would be against common sense and would be against a true scientific approach. The Quran says in Surah 3 verse 90, Behold, in the creations of the heavens and the earth and the alternations of night and day, herein indeed are signs for men who reflect. Herein are deed, indeed signs for men of understanding. In Christendom, you have not done your homework. You have not done your research. We need to be honest. We need to be honest with these facts. And we need to basically analyze our scripture, not get emotional, not get worked up, but look at it in a holistic sense. And may all of us, may God bless all of us. I'd like to end with the verse of the Quran which says, وَقُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُكَ That when truth is held against that which is not true, that which is false, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. وَآخِرُ الدَّعْوَانَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Thank you very much. That was again another interesting part. We saw that the first part was very interesting, the second part was also very interesting. Now we're going to have the rebuttal. There's just a request that was asked for me. I just want to say, 
uh, what happened in this, uh, why I'm here tonight, is not because of Muslims that forced me or I am sitting here amongst Muslims and this thing is organized by Muslims. Uh, in July or June at Erasmus and Pretoria, Pretoria, I listened to the IPCI's presentation and the attacks that I thought, what I saw, I did not like against the Bible. And then I challenged Mr. Yusuf uh, Ishmael here for a debate. I said, all I want is just 45 minutes to stand here to show you another version of what the Bible really consists of. So uh, please do not think this is being run by Muslims and uh, they are overwhelming me uh, or anything like this. That is not the case. The case is, I told uh, Yusuf, please, you carry on. You make the arrangements. You decide how this is going to be run. I will just fall in. I just want to be here and to talk to you. I'm not one of these people that want to work with laws and these rules. And it's not nothing to do with it. I don't even want to go into any confrontation about this. Uh, so again, I say thank you to Yusuf for everything that he's done. Uh, I just want to clear one thing. It's beautiful. These uh, two contradictions that I saw. The one was from uh, Zakir Naik on that uh, CD against uh, uh, Dr. Campbell. We showed two, uh, uh, two uh, namelists. Uh, came in, coming from Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, unfortunately, I didn't have time here tonight to show that contradiction to you, but that's, not, that's no contradiction at all. All I want to say is that Ezra and Nehemiah, in that context, says that there was 42,360 people that went back to Jerusalem to rebuild Jerusalem. Now, if you go and read in that contradiction, because if you add it up, the one gives you 29,000, the other one gives you 31,000. Just a verse before that, it says, and these were the names of the men. So they didn't count the women and they didn't count the children. So that's why you get this uh, contradiction between 28,000 and uh, 42,000. Or uh, 29,000, 42,000, other one, 31,000 and 42,000. The others that went back to Jerusalem were obviously women and children. And they were not mentioned because that was the custom of that time. Tonight, uh, Yusuf stood here, he showed you the two genealogies of Jesus. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to give you, I've got the King James Version here. Uh, it's not a very good one. I'm going to buy myself one at the end of the week, I promise you that. Uh, what it says here, if you read in Matthew, you'll see a, geon a geology, uh, genealogy of Jesus counting 42 people. Uh, if you read it in uh, Luke, I'm not going to give you the, the, the verses, you will see it counts... I can't remember how many, but it's a long list, and it's different names. The reason for that is, if you read the, uh, the Bible, you'll see it says, big, <clears throat> I just want to get that word, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, what the word means there, it says that Eli was the father of Joseph. 